Hello and welcome to another Small World Podcast. It is July 31st, 2019, and tonight's topic, Fed cuts interest rates for the first time in the age of Bitcoin. Well, they did it after a lot of harassing by President Trump. The Fed looks like they've caved, and let's listen to Fed Chair Jerome Powell explain what happened. Good afternoon and welcome. We decided today to lower the target for the federal funds rate by a quarter of a percentage point to a range of 2% to 2.25%. The outlook for the U.S. economy remains favorable, and this action is designed to support that outlook. It is intended to ensure against downside risks from weak global growth and trade policy uncertainty to help offset the effects these factors are currently having on the economy and to promote a faster return of inflation to our symmetric 2% objective. All of these objectives will support achievement of our overarching goal to sustain the expansion with a strong job market and inflation close to our objective for the benefit of the American people. As Mark Levine would say, all right, that's enough. All right, that is enough. And basically, it's just justification out of thin air as to why they raised interest rates. Um, I guess the best way you could justify it is it's a precautionary measure because the way they describe the economy everything is fine they may have a little trade dispute here or there but they look like they were gonna lower interest rates and they did now this is the first interest rate cut since 2008 um, and it's fallen in line with what I've been saying since 2015 2014, I was saying the Fed would raise interest rates when commentators like Peter Schiff were saying they can't ever raise rates, they'll crash the economy, they'll never raise rates, and then they raised them once, and then he said, well, they're never going to raise them again, then they raised them twice, and I said after the first rate hike, they'd raise them again. The Fed has to be ahead of other central banks. The Fed, uh, the dollar is a reserve currency, it has to pay a rate of interest. Uh, then they raised them again, and Peter said, well, that's it. They're not going to raise them anymore. Finally, they raised them eight times, and I think he stopped saying that they're not going to raise rates anymore. But I think he insisted he was still correct because uh, they raised them not as much as other people thought they might have raised them. And back in 2014 and 15, I did say they would raise rates, but that they would never normalize them. And th that was on the basis that all other central banks were going to start lowering and this really is why they lowered interest rates today is not just Trump haranguing everyone but the ECB the Bank of Japan they are at zero they are not moving at all and the United States the Fed does have a bit of uh, blue sky between it and other central banks so I think this may be an accommodation or this may be the beginning of a easing cycle but again it is the first interest rate cut since 2008 and as I mentioned it is the first interest rate cut since the invention of Bitcoin Bitcoin came out in 2009 and one of the advantages that proponents of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that have hard caps is that they are deflationary and here's a case where Bitcoin came out and during the time period of Bitcoin, let's take a look what happened. Well, the Fed increased its balance sheet. Not only did it lower interest rates in 2009, 10, 11, 12, and did quantitative easing, well, the quantitative easing resulted in the purchase of, or the monetizing of U.S. debt securities and also buying mortgage-backed securities and other agency debt of the United States. And you can see they took their balance sheet from about $800 billion in 2008 and ratcheted that thing up to about $4 trillion. And right now they're at about 3.8. That's the quantitative tightening. They did let some of their bonds roll off, a little bit of sales there. But it doesn't look like uh, the Fed is now interested in rolling off this balance sheet at any particular speed. So it looks like quantitative easing for a period of about six years and zero interest rates for the longest period of time. And then a couple of years of tightening, a little bit of uh, asset sales, and now it looks like it's all over. And we're now at the point where... Uh, 
the balance sheet's going to stay swollen, but it's not the same size. I mean, the ECB is much larger. China is racking up more debt than the Fed is. Now, the United States government is racking up debt. This whole global economy is racking up debt across the board, and I guess the United States is taking the view, the Fed is taking the view that... Um, we can afford to do it because everyone else is worse. Everyone else is more profligate than we are. Now, here is that you heard that was uh, Jerome Powell, Fed chair, making his statement. This is the statement. That was his own statement that he gave at a press conference. I'll leave a link to the a YouTube on the smoggle.com website in the resources section. But here is the statement from the Fed, the Federal Open Market Committee meeting of which Jerome Powell chairs, and it's the same type of justification in light of for the, the rate cut, light of implications, global developments for the economic outlook, as well as muted inflation pressures. The committee decided to lower the target rate. They could have used that to keep uh, rates the same as well. It says the action supports the committee's view that sustained economic expansion and strong labor market conditions and inflation near the committee's symmetric 2% objective are the most likely outcome. Again, they could have left the rates, the rates the same and used the same language, but uncertainties about this outlook remain. Well, of course, no outlook is certain. You can never have a certain outlook. So this is just a bunch of Fed speak. But what's interesting, I want to go down to the bottom, is it says the committee will conclude the reduction of its aggregate securities holdings in the system's open market account in August, two months earlier than previously indicated. Okay, and then also, it wasn't a unanimous decision. Esther George and Eric Rosenstein preferred at this meeting to keep the target rate where it was between two and a quarter and two and a half instead of two to two and a quarter, and they were looking not to raise interest rates. But the other ones on the committee, they went for the rate increase. Now, what did this do? Let's talk about gold, silver, Bitcoin, Litecoin. And what does this mean? Now, we haven't discussed the gold and silver for a while. So let's start with gold and silver, and then we'll get into what happened with the cryptocurrencies. Well, first of all, silver did not react well to the news. I don't know what the markets were expecting. My understanding was market participants were looking for this quarter rate hike. The market fell when it was announced. Uh, didn't really rebound on anything that Jerome Powell said later in his comments and in the press conference. But in the, again, I guess maybe silver had risen in anticipation of the rate cut. And this is, uh, I don't know, buying the rumor, sell on the news. I don't think it was a rumor. I think this one was pretty well telegraphed. There were some people thinking there might be a half a point rate cut. I didn't think that was possible. There was. I did a poll on Twitter today, and like one in four, one in five people actually thought that maybe they um, might not do anything with interest rates. But I think this was pretty well telegraphed. But in any event, silver took a breather today and was down almost 2% when it all And you can see it drifted lower all day, and then it fell. Now, some of you are just listening on podcasts uh you can go to smoggle.com and you can see the charts that we're talking about. Let's take a look at gold, but then I want to go through some gold and silver stories and some charts. But let's just take a look at the gold price. We're going to do both of them. Gold did the same thing today. It was holding steady most of the day, and then it kind of started to fall, and it fell. It also fell. It fell $18. It's still above $1,400. $1, it's at $1,412 at the close, but it did fall uh, 1.28 percent. Well, let's get back to silver. We'll return to gold in a moment. But let's look at silver and what's going on with silver. Some of you may know that I was on uh, with James Henry Anderson at Silver Doctors. We went through a bunch of charts. It's a good um, video to check out over at Silver Doctors. It's also up on BitChute. And I just want to follow up on some of the charts. It looks like that silver is still pouring into the COMEX depositories, which means, at least from my perspective, you guys can tell me what you think, that there are there is a hodler silver investor that does park a lot of silver in the COMEX depositories. Now, the silver that they park there is in the form of those 1,000 ounce 999 silver bars, and they can be traded on a moment's notice. They could be 
because they're eligible to be traded. They're in the form to be delivered. Remember, if you store silver at Brinks, like Monster Boxes, Silver Eagles, Rolls of Silver Eagles, Canadian Mint Bar, stuff like that, you can't sell that or trade that on the COMEX. You can sell it, but you have to have it removed from the Brinks vault or from coins and things, wherever it's being kept, and it has to be sent to the buyer. Uh, when you have the COMEX eligible and registered bars, they could be sold uh, or used to meet delivery requirements on the COMEX. The point is that there's over 320 million ounces of silver in the COMEX vaults, and that amount has been increasing, and it's not just JP Morgan's vault, but also the Brinks vault, the Coins and Things vault. Most of the vaults have shown increases in uh, the amount of silver that they're holding. So even more of an increase is in the SLV. Now the SLV and other ETFs have seen a sharp increase just in the last week or so in silver. And we talked about this with silver doctors that the silver SL, the SLV and the other silver ETFs like Sprott and Deutsche Bank and ETF securities, all the ones listed there. The big one is the, the one in the, uh, and if Pew Green there is SLV, but that's gone from like 320, 325 million ounces all the way up to 355 million ounces just in the past couple of weeks. And all of them have seen, you can see to the far right of the chart, increases in silver. And it's not so much because there's an increase in the price of silver. It just seems to be that silver is under accumulation. I think that's a very important thing. I'll say it again. Silver is under accumulation. Silver volume on the COMEX is higher open interest and silver accumulation is happening. It's not happening at the U.S. Mint sales. We're not seeing uh, people buying at the retail level a lot of silver or at least fresh silver. They may be buying from the bullion dealers, backdated eagles and other silver products. But if they were really buying them in big amounts, that would spill over and reflect in demand for newly minted silver eagles and we're not seeing that yet so one could argue as i did last week on silver doctors that the so-called smart money big money looks like it could be wrong that it's moving into silver now you look at the price the price is that black line that moves up and down and you could see it went up and it went down it went up and by 2011 it's gone down ever since but interestingly enough the amount of silver held in these etfs has gone up and right now is at all time highs. You wanna compare that to gold, it's totally different. The gold ETFs, they're not really holding gold the way that it looks like they're holding silver and parking it there irrespective of price. For the gold, it, it essentially follows, the gold ETF flows follow the price. Price goes up, they add the positions and the price goes down, they, you can just see it. It follows uh, along, Craig Hemke and I from, um, Turk Ferguson uh, from, what does he have? TF Metals, yeah. Uh, we've made the same observation here that this basically follows the flows. The fl I mean, the flows follow the price of gold. Totally different than what you see in silver. Silver is not following the flows at all. The price, the prices are not following the flows. The flows are not following the prices. The silver is just being stacked into the ETFs, irrespective of the price. But recently it's made a, Probably the biggest spike since, if you look in 2010 to 2011, there was a bit of a spike there. This one looks even sharper, especially given the uh, base that it's building from. So lots of accumulation of silver in the silver ETFs, including SLV. You're also seeing just similarly in platinum. We've seen a little bit of a spike there too. There's your platinum ETFs. Platinum and silver, both very, very beaten down, undervalued, I would say, uh, precious metals. Palladium's had a massive run. Gold has had a decent run. Palladium and uh, platinum and silver have gotten massacred. Um, but you're seeing, it looks like accumulation institutional investors. One other thing I want to show you on um, silver is, I've made this point before, you can look it up. Uh, on BitChute. I, I think I, I released it back to the public on YouTube. It's also on smogel.com. Chinese silver stackers versus American silver stackers. I make the point 
Chinese are no fan of silver. Americans buy more investment silver, not just on a per capita basis than the Chinese, but also in total tonnage. Americans buy more, and you know China's three or four times the size in population as the United States. But I wanted to show you this chart. This chart basically shows you silver is a net um, export. Uh, if you look at the chart. Since 2001, more silver ends up flowing out of Hong Kong from China than comes in. Now, if you flip that over, China is very well known for being uh, enamored with gold. Now, you can see there's a lot different there. There you can see lots of gold flowing in from Hong Kong. Uh, China mines a decent amount of silver. It mines a decent of uh, the world's most amount of gold, even though it doesn't have the most, the largest in-ground reserves. It does mine the most gold. So China is very gold focused. The people are for gold focused. Silver, not so much. I just want to point that out. I think people think that gold and silver are almost attached at the hip. They go together. They don't. Uh, India is does buy a lot of silver. Does buy import a lot of silver. Imports a lot of gold for different reasons. But um, Indians clearly prefer gold. But if you look at the numbers, uh, silver is not uh, tossed aside, at least the way it seems to be in China compared to, to silver. All right, let's, if there's anything else on silver we need to talk about, then we're going to look at some of these gold uh, charts. I think that's all we had for silver tonight. Yep, that's it. Let's take a look at gold. Some other things I did mention the Chinese gold mining production. There you go, over 400 tons since 2012 a year in gold. That's world leading. Second most is Australia at about 350, and then you go into Russia at about three and a quarter. And this gold does not leave China, as you can see. Not only do they produce these 400 tons of gold a year, but they import hundreds of tons. So China is definitely on the gold accumulation, and it doesn't all end up at the People's Bank of China. It doesn't all end up at their central bank, but uh, it certainly stays in the country. And let's just take a look. Here's Russia. Yeah, Russia is about 314 tons produced last year. And Russia in recent years, the last two years, 2017-2018, has added 86% of their mining production directly to their central bank, which doesn't leave them much room to export gold, although they do export some to China. They're starting to do joint ventures on some mines for investment within Russia. And they agreed late last year, I think, to sell a little gold to India. Remember, India has no gold mining production. They've got an old gold mine left over from the British era. But uh, they haven't really gotten that one started. So India relies on imports, both legal and smuggled, and existing secondary supply to get their gold. But you can see Russia and China, big gold producers adding gold to reserves. And Kazakhstan, the little sleeper there, they've been, add, they've been mining. They've doubled their mining production since 2011, 2012. They now mine about 85 tons, and they're adding about 50, 55 tons a year. They've basically been adding gold every month since 2014. So as their gold mining production ramps up, Kazakhstan just keeps adding monthly amounts and is growing its gold reserves. One final point on gold. There you can see is a good chart. This is the central banks are buying gold. Well. As we mentioned, the bulk of the central banks that are buying are Russia, China, and Kazakhstan, gold producers all. But you do see an increase in gold reserves, kind of bottomed in the 2005-2006 era. Since the financial crisis, they've moved up. You can see them declining. You got Brown's Bottom there, which was in the UK when Gordon Brown sold most of the UK's gold at about $300 an ounce. Year 2000, as Switzerland sold 60% of theirs in that around that time period. But you can see central banks now. This is their gold reserves are increasing. All right, let's move over to crypto and see how did the cryptocurrencies react to this first rate cut since Bitcoin has been invented, so to speak. 
Well, let's take a look. First of all, the Bitcoin uh, six month chart. Now, Bitcoin's been on a tear. It's been from $3,000, went all the way up to almost $14,000 in a very short period of time. Let's take a look at the one year chart. Here's the one year chart. And you can see it's ahead year over year now. Now, there's been a lot of talk of how Bitcoin had crashed, everyone lost their money. Well, people who hodled during that period or people who bought even what looks like the highs at eight, nine thousand dollars well they're better off today than they were a year ago and of course if they bought in the December, January, February, March, April period they're up two and three times and today Bitcoin reacted even though it was well telegraphed fairly nicely rising all day from about 95 75 all the way over to 10,050 and that's about where it is today so a big day for Bitcoin it rose after the news and it continued to rise it rose all day now I don't know if there's a correlation to that but um, it doesn't hurt when Bitcoin Litecoin have set amounts and of course the Fed has no set amounts of money that it can print or currency it can print dollars it can print uh, let's take a look at Ethereum same thing one year uh, you're down in Ethereum if you've been holding for a year. Ethereum is not done as well as you can see on that chart. Six month period though, uh, Ethereum has come back just a little bit. Has come back a little bit. You can see if you bought uh, early in the year, you know, you'd be up. It was down. Uh, it was way down. It looks like it's down around a hundred dollars, so a little less than that. So it's doubled in the last uh, <clears throat> six months. And today, Ethereum, do I even have the price today? So yeah, here it is. Ethereum went up, fell down. So just like Bitcoin, it pretty much went up today. Litecoin was the big winner today. Let's take a look at Litecoin. It's been the big winner this year, the big winner in the last six months. Let's take a look at what's going on with Litecoin. Litecoin is doing its halving in five days. And that halving, there you go. They're saying Litecoin could, could blast off due to having having basically means every four years the amount of reward that's available per block number of coins that'll be produced will be cut in half which means less fresh Litecoin less fresh Bitcoin will be coming on the market and if people are hodling their Bitcoin or Litecoin it's the same like India where you're going to rely on imports in India to get your gold well then you're going to have to rely on freshly mined Litecoin and Bitcoin to get your Bitcoin and Litecoin. And if only half the amount is coming out, well, then there tends to be a price squeeze. Of course, there is secondary supply. But as I mentioned, if they're hodling or not letting it go, then you're reliant on the miners. And that's why I want to talk tomorrow. I believe Square is releasing its numbers on how much Bitcoin it's sold uh, just from its Square app. And I think they're starting to eat up a large percentage of the newly mined Bitcoin and Bitcoin is having its having in less than a year. But let's see what Litecoin did today on the news or just because it did. Here's the Litecoin one year chart. You're clearly ahead if you bought even at $70 last August. Price is close to $100 at the moment. However, if you bought in the last six months, well, you might have bought it uh, $22. $25. The price is quadruple to that. It's at 100 Had it reached a peak, it almost got to $150 back in June. You can see that on the chart. That is game changing to go from 20 22 to $147. Something like that. All right. Uh, Litecoin and Bitcoin ATMs. We haven't talked about those in a while. Let's just look. I mean, this a lot of Bitcoin and Litecoin. I'd, I'd like to get an aggregate, but I'm sure it's hard to do. But uh, like the Square app, which is selling a lot of Bitcoin, I'm just wondering how much Bitcoin gets sold in these 5,300 Bitcoin, e uh, Bitcoin, ETS, Bitcoin ATMs. There's 5,300 of them. I don't know how much they sell. I would imagine it's not as convenient to use them as it is to use the Square app. But again, they're all over the place when you have 5,300. And an interesting thing is not only are there 5,300 of them, Litecoin is in 
th almost 3,500 of them. You could see there, altcoins 3,700, Bitcoin with the most with 5,320, and then Litecoin the second most with 3,493. They have a category called altcoin, which means if it had Litecoin or any combination of the others, there'd be 3,700. All right, I think that's it for Litecoin. Let's get back to Bitcoin and then we'll call it a night. Couple of stories here. There's a crypto bank and you're starting to see these come out. They're trying to integrate, and this is something I've been predicting for years now, the integration of fiat currencies, payment systems, banking systems, eventually the financial systems with cryptocurrencies. I don't think this is a banned situation. I think this is a integration system. Well, Sony Ventures, co-leads a 13 million dollar euro or 13 million euro raise about 15 million dollars for crypto banking startup Bitwallet. this is a german bank so they're going to launch a bank and it'll be crypto friendly so some banks are not they won't take crypto accounts they'll restrict your accounts so this is the old build your own and it looks like there's big money looking to help uh banks do that. I think Litecoin and another entity also purchased a German bank with the same understanding. More acquisitions going on. Kraken boosts institutional offerings with acquisition of Dan Hell's Interchange. Again, just not a big deal, but it looks like there's a lot of this institutional investing going on in the cryptocurrency space. We saw Ledger X finally got its approval for its uh, physically delivered Bitcoin and it started trading on that I believe today that's what BACT is planning on doing um, but Ledger X beat them to it we discussed that a few weeks back when they got that so the idea that we're heading towards a, a ban it's going the other way the CFTC has approved U.S. Commodities Futures Trading Commission has approved this type of trading and it's not just well, they're just trading the price. It's like a bet. No, no, they're allowing. No, 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 no. Salt on them a little bit. No, they're actually allowing the delivery, the storage and delivery of Bitcoin in relation to those contracts. And finally, uh, we talked the other day. We reviewed what happened at the crypto hearings, the Senate crypto hearings, and we had a statement came out after the hearings from the chairman uh, I think his name is Krako something like that anyway he is the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee and he put out a statement he said with the appropriate balance of regulations digital currencies and their innovative underlying technology could provide meaningful benefits so looks like they are plenty of allies in the Congress in the Senate if you may not have one in the White House or at the Treasury Secretary position, Mnuchin, Mnuchin, whatever his name is, um, they're the ones who write the regulations, not the President, not the Treasury Secretary. And it looks like they believe, as I do too, that the most prudent approach for a government is not an outright ban. That you just end up running around spending a lot of money on enforcement. Uh, and it's not... Um, just anything goes but regulation because regulation you get to get a purview not as as Robert Mueller would say that is in your purview when you regulate because you get to see the trading that's going on you encourage regulated trading exchange centralized exchanges and that gives you the opportunity to corral a good portion of the ecosystem into the financial system into the tax system into financial system into the trading systems into the storage approved systems where you have an insight as to what's going on with cryptocurrencies when you ban it you obviously have none um, but this way if you have proper regulation you get the benefits of taxation the benefits of tracking and you also get the benefits of innovation and I think that is the prudent approach that most governments are following. I think that's where the U.S. is headed as well. All right, I want to thank everyone for joining me tonight. And um, please remember to subscribe to smallgold.com. Uh, all the charts are over there. Uh, that's right. You, if you sign up there, you get the emails from Small Gold. Also, if you sign up on 
bit shoot you get and you click hit the bell you will get your notifications whenever we put out a new blog post so please check that out and also remember to support smallgold.com I'll leave up the fundraising page there you can send checks cash silver gold to small LLC PO box 714 Dover New Hampshire 03820 or you can just drop me a line I do enjoy getting your letter some people send me emails some actually take the time and write a letter put a stamp on it or you can donate to small Gold via patreon or make a donation on a monthly basis or you can make a one-time payment on PayPal or a recurring donation on PayPal or you can make one-off donations on Bitcoin or Litecoin at the QR codes that you see there or at the addresses below or you can become I do need subscribe star members I have three but they don't let me take the money out unless I have five so someone would like to help me out and join a subscribe star a mug stacker club there please do so have a good night